critical that he was um, a loner in his life, uh, hardly understood and hardly accepted, certainly put on a very tall platform and just kept there. Um, so indeed he was very radical, but he, he didn't believe in extremes. And I, I guess he was a great, um, I think, inwardly, great follower of the Buddha. And if I've understood anything about the Buddha's life, it very, very simply, in a very simple way, um, it was the middle path that I think Rabindranath felt very drawn to. For example, anniversaries of great men of action and compassion who belonged to India's multiple cultures and religious traditions and to the world such as Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, Chaitanya and Ram Mohan Roy as India's first modern reformer were observed with prayer and discourse to sensitize the Shantiniketan community in realizing our many streams of culture. And sorry, this slight typo there. This, uh, there's been a, obviously a space has creeped in to the word streams. Um, so I'm happy to tell you that some of these um, observances are, are, are still there, are extant. Um, not all though. Uh, Buddha Purnima is certainly <coughs> observed um, and Krishna Chap, Christmas Day, the birth of Christ, is still very uh, beautifully observed. Um, he wrote and composed secular plays and musicals to celebrate the seasons as well as the folk and cult classical traditions. The function of art, thus drawn from and inspired by the folk and classical traditions, was given a central place in the Shantiniketan education. Classical Vinkar, Sanghavishpur Shastri, many of them we were invited to Shantiniketan to come and stay there to teach. Ustad Alauddin Khan was also there for some time. Shantiniketan celebrated secular festivals with music and dance. I'm sure so many of you have heard of the dance dramas which Tobinra composed. Chitrangura, Tashirtesh, Chandalika, Nautik Puja. He was keen also to reach out to the world <clears throat> and thus to take his country out of the isolation imposed by colonial rule. With his award of the Nobel Prize in 1913 for his Gitanjali song offerings, he became a world traveler, uh, the English version of Gitanjali is known as Gitanjali, song offerings, within parenthesis, song offerings, within parenthesis. He traveled to 30 countries in five continents in the post-World War years. The enthusiasm with which his messages of international cooperation as an alternative to war an aggressive nationalism were received in Europe <coughs> led him to the idea that India was the fittest place for starting an international center. Uh, wh when he traveled the world, he gave a series of three lectures which are celebrated as his nationalism lectures. Uh, they were nationalism in India, nationalism in Japan, nationalism in the West. Uh, so these were the classic lectures that he was giving uh, to bring people away from war and aggressive <coughs> nationalism, territorial nationalism. And where else but at Shantiniketan 
could this be done? His idea of a center for international cooperation, in other words. This endeavor became his, his Vishwabharati University. His Vishwabharati International University. That is exactly what it was called. He kept his university model simple, offering India's classic hospitality to scholars, artists, musicians, indologists, and scientists, inviting them to exchange knowledge of histories and cultures to diffuse conflict. They were expected to collaborate <coughs> in intellectual companionship and creative activity without opposing interests and without national boundaries. Rabindranath seriously believed in this lot that he wrote on this, that the works of creative people, whether they be artists, musicians, scientists, even the works of saints, when not for a single nation. They were for everybody, even though they individually may have belonged, obviously, to a single country, to a single nation. So that was a very, um, a, a, a very persistent idea that he um, uh, wrote about and worked on, I think, at Vishwabharati. That was his playground, um, Vishwabharati was. His university was not going to offer degrees. Vishwabharati's logo was taken from the Vedas, Yatra Vishwam Eka Niram, meaning where the whole world meets in one nest. <coughs> he wrote, where truth is concerned, there is no question of East or West. That is the truth we must strive for here at Vishwabharati. There was a time in the 1920s and 1930s when Shantiniketan and Sriniketan became part of an international community. Once again, excuse me for that typo. So, in the 1920s and 30s, Shanti Niketan and Sriniketan became part of an international community. It was short-lived, but it was quite real. What does that mean? Uh, could you expand a bit on that? Yes, I think you would see what I mean. And I will indeed, if you want me to expand more, but maybe first these pictures. Basically, it just meant that scholars were coming, artists were coming from all over the world to this very remote corner of rural Bengal. So that's, you know, that's the international community that was being formed for uh, periods of time in the 1920s and 1930s. You may well ask, why did it stop at that time? Well, Rabindranath, of course, died in 1941. So basically, there had to be some change. Um, and the institution was funded entirely uh, on private funding, never government funding. So that was a big gap, which is always inevitable when people give for an, uh, a great individual, then there is obviously a slump when, when that individual is born. So basically that's it. Professor Sten Kono of Norway teaching uh, at Vishwabharati, many of them very famous. I mean, this is just a very few examples that I can bring to you uh, due to constraints of time. But there were, many of them were famous Indologists studying India and bringing scientific learning of the study of India to, to us. That was also the idea. Uh, methods of scientific research was something Rabindranath was very, very keen on. And although we had um, uh, obviously much more learning in our own culture, those that cultivated it, the Sanskritists. But not necessarily were we, were we using the scientific methods of research. So that was another. So this is uh, Professor Silva Levy um, and Madame Levy. Uh, Silva Levy was a, one of the world's greatest sinologists um, and came from the Sorbonne as Vishwabharati's first 
visiting professor in 1921. And again, let me just add here <coughs> that Shanti Niketan was India's first center for the study of China, Chinese culture and civilization, <coughs> really in order to study two very old civilizations, our own and China's. Vincent Lesney, another Orientalist, another great um, uh, Indologist um, uh, from the Institute of Prague, the Oriental Institute of Prague, studying an ancient Indian manuscript with uh, part of this thing has got cut off a bit. But anyway, with um, this very famous Sanskritist, when, which, whom many of you will know by name, Vidushekara Shastri. This is uh, Tan Munshan. A uh, Chinese scholar who helped Rubinrat <coughs> to found the China Bhavana, the Hall of Chinese Studies. Chinese language, Chinese history, Chinese culture, and civilization is what uh, China Bhavana uh, stands for even today. And China Bhavana is extant and is um, <coughs> a working institution today. The first Sino Indian society was also established at Shanti Niketan at the same time. This is 1937, inc incidentally, so much later. It took time because they had to raise funds um, to do this. Mm. It has the, the only other place in Asia which has the entire set of the Buddhist Tripitaka, the China Bhavana Library. Mm. So a very, very significant institution and obviously began many years ago before, you know, what we are, I suppose, getting back to today. So Kala Bhavana students studying with British sculptor Marguerite Milward. So this again is sort of the international community I was referring to. People were actually staying there and working with the students, working with the teachers. Music class with Alain Danielou, <coughs> ethnomusicologist from France. The final experiments in this new 